invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1 is our text. Uh, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,164 and you will be able to follow along. And as always, if you are here and you don't have a Bible, please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, if you're joining us online, we're glad to have you as well, and we hope that you'll join us looking at Philippians chapter 1. But if you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, then please let us know. Email us, communicate with us, call us. We will send a Bible to you or hand deliver it to you if you're close enough or live in Hawaii. So, uh, because we know that if you... Read and apply God's word. God will change your life, and we're committed to seeing that happen. So, hey, uh, can I just echo what Robert said earlier? You do not want to miss next week, whether you are in person or online. Uh, join us. Uh, Daniel Ritchie is one of the finest young men I've ever known. Uh, his will and determination to overcome adversity will amaze you and inspire you. Uh, his story of how God has redeemed his brokenness, I think, will encourage you tremendously. And, and here's just a, a, a plea. If you know somebody who is really struggling with the hand that life has dealt them, beg, borrow, or bribe to get them here. Okay? Uh, I, I'm just saying that, that this is the kind of weekend, uh, next weekend, where... Uh, it, just simply because of Daniel's presence, because of Daniel's message, because of Daniel's life situation, uh, God can use that in ways that uh, a lot of people won't listen to me, won't listen to Pastor Joe, won't listen to Pastor Robert, but they might be willing to listen to somebody who removes those obstacles and says, hey, you think you've got it bad, I probably had it worse, and look what God has done. Look what God is doing. So I'm just saying, don't miss that opportunity. I know you guys are always thinking about who you can invite to join you online or in the room, uh, but uh, go out of your way this week and make that extra effort, uh, and let's see what God does next weekend. Hey, what, uh, what repetitive phrase did your parents use when you were growing up, so much so that it is burned into your psyche right now? What what phrase did you hear over and over and over again so that even now you can hear your mom or your dad's voice saying it to you? Uh, here's some of the things that I remember from, um, by the way, uh, you guys can talk about this in, you know, over dinner or, you know, in your small groups, in your life groups, uh, or with your families later on, because it's a fun thing. I, in fact, uh, I dare you to ask your adult children this question and see what they say. But some things I remember was, uh, and some of you heard these too, if it was a snake... It would have bit you. Our moms all went to the same school of cliches, didn't they? <laughs> that, that might have been the most oft-repeated phrase, uh, you know, either that or were you born in a barn because uh, we left the door open. Uh, you know, uh, just over and over and over again. If it was a snake, it would bit you. And, and I don't like snakes. I've never been bit by a snake. So, uh, but uh, I heard that again and again and again. Now, uh, another one that, that my dad said a lot uh, was can't, never could do nothing. Can't, never could do nothing. And can I, I just confess, as a kid, I just looked at him like, I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I have no idea what you're trying to get at. Now as an adult, I get it. Now as a leader, I understand what he was saying. I just wish he would have explained it. I think that he may have uh, taken that uh, out of an old Henry Ford Quote, you know, the guy who founded Ford Motor Company who said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So, uh, you know, uh, probably so. But I still remember that like, okay, scratch my head, now I get it. Uh, another one I heard a lot from both my parents, uh, and, it, and it's brilliant, it's biblically based, but it's not a quote from Scripture, was two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right, which is a great truth, I wish I'd connected it to Romans 19, where God says, do not take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God, for vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Uh, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he serves to give him something to drink, for in so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Because it's so biblically based, but uh, they didn't connect that. I just connected it to math, where two negatives do make a positive. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to, trying to do the equation, and it, and it didn't work for me. So two wrongs don't make a right. 
Now, one that, that uh, I heard over and over and over again, especially when I was complaining about doing chores. Anybody else complain about doing chores uh, as a kid? Yeah, that never seemed to work, uh, but uh, I, I did it anyway. But complaining about doing chores was my parents just looked at me and went, no job is beneath you. No job is beneath you. And, and I, I love that. I didn't like it at the time. Can I just say that? Didn't appreciate it at the time, but as I grew up, I really, really appreciate it. And as somebody who has been a professional dishwasher and toilet cleaner, uh, I understand the power in that uh, statement. By the way, I'm still excellent at those. Just ask my wife. So, so I hope that you will share some of your uh, you know, phrases that were oft repeated, uh, again, over dinner or with your life group or with your family, because that'll be a lot of fun. Hey, we're looking at Philippians, and Philippians is one of 13 letters in the New Testament that the Apostle Paul wrote. And, and I mentioned the repetitive phrases, because when you're reading Scripture, and remember, we want you to read the Bible, that's why we give Bibles away. When, when you're reading Scripture, notice the things that are repeated often. Like, we know that, that God loves us because Scripture tells us that God loves us over and over and over again. We know that we're supposed to love others because Scripture tells us that over and over and over again. So look for those themes that are repeated because they stand out. And, and if you read Paul's letters, there is a theme that is found in five of his letters. He's, he repeats the phrase or the theme six times in five letters to churches. And it has to do with the subject of followers of Jesus living a worthy life. Living a worthy life. And he says to uh, the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 4, he says, I, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In his letter to uh, the Colossians, uh, chapter 1, he says, uh, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, he, he says, I exhort each of you and encourage you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. In 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 1, he, he uses a phrase twice. First of all, he says, uh, I want you to be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. And then later on he says, to this end we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work by faith, uh, by his power. And then we're looking at a text today in Philippians chapter 1, beginning at verse 27, that focuses on this subject of living a worthy life. In verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, Philippians, the Apostle Paul says, only let your manner of life be worthy of of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's the challenge. That's the call. That's the, the phrase that we're looking at today that is oft repeated by the Apostle Paul. So I want you to, to understand, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God is challenging you to live your life worthy of the gospel of Jesus. He, he wants us, who are followers, to live lives that are worthy. He says it over and over and over again. And, and today what I want to do is, is look at what the Apostle Paul says and, and what he says that looks like. What does it mean to live a life worthy of the gospel? Now, now before we make some application, let me just clarify, no one is actually worthy of the gospel. In and of ourselves, we are unworthy. 
Okay, we, we don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve to represent Jesus. We don't deserve uh, any of the blessings that we get because we're sinners and we've defied God. We've rebelled against God. We've rejected God. But God loved us so much. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus into this world to be the sacrifice for your sins so that through grace, through the gift of God given in Jesus, you can be forgiven of your sins and included in his family and sent out to be his servants. So we are saved by grace. And we receive forgiveness, we receive the promise of heaven, and so because of that, because of the gift we've received, out of gratitude, we want to represent Jesus well. We want to represent Jesus to the world in the way that honors Jesus and pleases Jesus. So uh, that's what we're talking about. How can we represent Jesus to this world and live a life that is worthy of the gospel? Well, the first thing that we need to do is have unity for the mission. Living a life worthy of the gospel means that we have unity for the mission. Look at verse 27 again. The apostle says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you, whether I'm there in your presence or just hear about you, I hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. One mind... One spirit striving together for the faith of the gospel. When Paul is writing this, as, as Pastor Joe shared last week, he was probably chained up between Roman soldiers, centurions. And, and, and he's looking at these soldiers, and some people said he was actually chained to them, you know, like handcuffed to one on either side, and others just say they were guarding him. It doesn't matter. They were the visual in front of him all the time. When he went to bed, when he woke up, when he was eating, there were the Roman soldiers. And so he's looking at these guys that are the most renowned fighters in the world. I mean, the Roman legions were, without a doubt, the dominant fighting force in the first century. And, and he's looking at them, and the picture in his mind of what we, as the people of God, should be, uh, he's saying, hey, we ought to be fighting for the gospel in the same way that the legions fight together. Not killing people, but fighting together for the gospel. Let me be really clear about that. So, um, it, the Roman legions, the reason that they were the dominant fighting force was in their discipline and in their unity. Their discipline and their teamwork. Basically, when they were fighting an opponent, if they stayed together as a group, if they fought together, they almost always won. Um, but if one of them broke, if they began to run, if they gave up, they lost. But when they stayed together, when they fought side by side, protecting the person to their side, then they were uh, just an indomitable force in that century. So uh, we honor Jesus by being unified as the people of God about the mission of Jesus. Okay, let me say that again. We honor Jesus. We're living a life worthy of the gospel by being unified as the people of God about the mission of of Jesus. So if you want to understand one of the reasons why America is morally bankrupt, turning away from God and adversarial towards the church, this might be a clue. Because historically, the people of God in America have excelled at fighting with each other instead of fighting together for the gospel. Now, I don't know how you were raised, but I grew up Baptist. Southern Baptist, to be exact, because if you grew up Southern Baptist, they made sure that you knew you weren't like those other Baptists. <laughs> we were better than them. In fact, we were raised to think we were better than everybody. Okay? And I'm guessing that your church was probably the same. But I growing up Southern Baptist, I knew what, uh, you know, I knew why, all the distinctives about being a Baptist. I knew what, you know, what we believed, and I knew why you guys were wrong. Okay? I knew why the Nazarenes were wrong, and I knew why the Christian church was wrong, and I knew why the Methodists and the Lutherans were wrong, and, and, and I definitely knew why the Charismatics were wrong. We knew how, and yeah, let's not even talk about the Catholics, because I was taught, you know, they couldn't even love Jesus, you know, because they were Catholic. And, you know, what I'm saying is, we were terrible at unity, because every church I've encountered kind of grew up with the same flavor. We're the ones who are right, and everybody else is wrong, and we got to make sure that they know they're wrong, and they got to make sure that we know, they're, that they know we're right, and so we just argued. 
In fact, uh, for most of my lifetime, even up to today, Christians and churches and pastors regularly and publicly disparage, attack, and accuse each other, whether it be of heresy or compromise or wrong motives. And in fact, it would be comical if it were not so devastating to the mission. Now, honestly, there are many churches and pastors that I would not agree with theologically, methodologically, or stylistically. But can I just say that if they preach Jesus as the one and only Savior, I want them to succeed. If they, if they preach Jesus as the way to heaven, I want them to succeed. Look, I don't have to agree with everything that they teach. I don't have to agree with the way they do it. I don't have to agree with all their values or how they do their worship service. Uh, but I want them to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Why? Because I want to fight with them for the gospel. I don't want to fight with them just to fight. And the reason why is because we have so much more in common than divides us. Look, if you believe Jesus is the, the, the way, the truth, and the life, we have way more in common than divides us. Uh, several years ago, oh, I guess I should can, confess first, I'm good friends with Father Chauncey, who's the head priest over at Our Lady of the Lake. Uh, I have a lot of respect for him, and we hang out, and we talk not nearly as much as I would like. And so a few years ago, uh, I said, hey, let's get our staffs together, because you're a big church, we're a big church, we have some of the same issues. Let's pull our teams together. Let's have lunch. And let's talk about the commonalities instead of the differences. And so we got together, our teams together, and, and we had lunch. We had a nice visit. But what we did is we took the Apostles' Creed. How many of you know what the Apostles' Creed is? Okay, a lot of you do. If you didn't raise your hand, Google it. It's all over the place. You can find it. Uh, it's, a, it's a statement from the, the third century, the early church. And, and they said, these are the basic tenets of what we believe. And you know what we did? And we went through as Baptists and Catholics. And we went through the Apostles' Creed. And you know what? We agreed on everything. We agreed. Now, we wouldn't agree on how to live it out. We wouldn't agree on how to interpret all the nuances. We wouldn't agree on the styles that, that it takes. But we agreed on the, on the substance. Because we have more in common than we have that divides us. And, and I want us to be unified about the mission. Now at Calvary, look, we got preachers up here. We preach our biblical convictions. But other than our five essential doctrines, I'm not really concerned if you agree with me. You say, well, pastor, I, I, I kind of feel strongly about this and I don't, you, don't, you feel differently. Don't care. I really don't care. As long as you don't demand equal time from the pulpit, we don't have any issues. <laughs> Okay, it just doesn't matter to me, okay? I'm not going to give you equal time anyway, but I mean, it, it's just, it's what I'm comfortable with. You don't have to agree. Like, we got five essentials, and, and you can look them up on our website, but I'll give them to you in the speed version. We believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. We believe there's one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God. He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, uh, died on the cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. We believe that all people are sinners and need the grace of God. And we believe that salvation is only through faith in Jesus Christ. So those five essentials. If you agree with those, man, you got a place that is here. If you disagree... Oh. Now, if you don't agree with anything else that we teach, like I said, I don't mind that at all as long as we are united in love and purpose. And our purpose here at Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we're all about. See, we want unity in mission, not uniformity. Let me say that again. We want unity in mission, not uniformity. Uh, because... Uh, if we do that, when we're united for the mission, we'll be successful for the kingdom. Now, let me just say this. If, uh, if you want better relationships, can I encourage you to look for what things you have in common with people instead of what divides you? Because that'll work in your relationships in the same way that it'll work in Christian beliefs and getting along. So, uh, we're united for the mission. We're going to be successful for the kingdom, 
And in other words, if we're united in the mission, we can be confident of victory. So living worthy of the gospel is being united in mission. It's being confident of victory. Look at verse 28. He says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. By the way, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Not being frightened in anything by your opponents. Paul says if we're not frightened, we're going to win. We're going to win. It's a sign of your victory. By the way, Jesus has already won the victory, so we're going to win, but it's nice to win the battles as well as the war. So a life representing Jesus well, a worthy life, is a life of courageous faith. Writer of Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God, for anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. We've got to have faith, and, and that faith has to be living and active in our lives. So we can't live worthy of the gospel if we are driven by fear. Driven by fear. It doesn't matter what we're afraid of if it controls us. You know, maybe you're afraid of life. What's going to happen next? By now, we should be convinced that none of us knows, right? And maybe you're afraid of the future, the uncertainty of the politics or the economy, or is there going to be a war? Maybe you're afraid of sickness or disease or death. It doesn't matter whether death is coming through COVID or cancer or flying. You're just afraid of dying. Can I remind you that Paul says your salvation is from God? In Romans 8, Paul said, nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. In Psalm 139, the psalmist says that all of our days were recorded before one of them came to be. Look, God knows the beginning. He knows the end. All right, he, he's aware of it. He's okay with it. And by the way, we should be okay with it because if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation, and heaven is our promised future. Uh, you know, we just sang the song, you know, he walked out of the grave, I'm walking too, right? Yeah. So if, uh, well, we didn't sing it, but Jamie rocked it. Uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, we're all humming along going, you sing it, girl. Uh, but, but, you know, we're, we're doing that, and, and we're singing the songs of faith. Are we living out that faith in our lives? Um, now, fear is a legitimate feeling, and we all experience it. All of us feel afraid at some point in our journey. There's nothing wrong with feeling afraid. Anxiety is a designated mental illness, and it's increasing in our culture. At the same time, we are called to walk by faith. We're called to trust in God, and we need to make decisions based on God's word, not our fears. It is perfectly fine to feel afraid. It's perfectly fine to feel anxious. Just don't make decisions based on fear. Fear is a terrible counselor. I mean, fear will paralyze you. Fear will, you know, prohibit you from finding joy and, and you know, walking in that faith. And, and so can I just encourage you to make your decisions based on God's word, not on your feelings, especially if your feelings are on fear. After all, Jesus won the victory, and we are in his family, so let's live with the confidence of our future no matter what happens in this world. It'll change your attitude, and it'll change the way you see life. So if we want to live worthy of the gospel, we've got to be united for the mission, we've got to be confident of victory, and this last point's the most difficult one to hear. We have to be honored to suffer. Honor to suffer. Verse 29, Paul continues, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Now, most of us never consider it a privilege to suffer. Because that's what Paul's saying. This is a privilege to suffer for Jesus. You know, look, if you're talking about privilege, if you're talking about, you know, feeling a, you know, like you've been gifted something, you know, gift me a new car. <laughs> you know, grant me the privilege of an all-expenses-paid vacation to Hawaii, okay? You know, grant me, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity to play Augusta National Golf Club, okay? Grant me, you know, those are, those are things that I'm excited about being granted. But Paul says, no, 
be excited about being granted the privilege of suffering for Jesus. Because that's what he calls it. It's a grace gift to suffer for Jesus. And by the way, that's not just the Apostle Paul who says it here. It is a recurring theme in the New Testament. If you read the New Testament, which we encourage you to do, um, you're going to find this over and over and over again. Jesus said to his disciples, by the way, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're one of his disciples, he said, um, if the world hated me, don't be surprised that they hate you. They hated me first. Jesus said when he was teaching in you know, Matthew 5, what's you know, called the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I don't know if you really feel blessed when people are, you know, blaspheming your name because you love Jesus. But Jesus says you should. The apostles. The apostles were, were crazy in love with Jesus, and they were just kind of crazy. Acts 5 tells the story of, of when uh, they were arrested and put on trial, and, they, and the Sanhedrin actually talked about executing them and came to their senses, so they only had them flogged. Okay, they were beaten with whips. This is horrible, pa terrible, painful punishment. And it says in Acts 5, 41, that they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for dishonor for the name of Jesus. They were rejoicing in their suffering, which, by the way, the Apostle Paul actually says that we are to do in Romans 5. He says, for we rejoice in our suffering because suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope will not disappoint. If you want to live a life of hope, it means you need to rejoice in suffering. <sighs> I don't know about you, but this is what the Bible says. It doesn't mean we have to be excited that it says it. And I know a lot of you are sitting there going, boy, I'm sure glad I didn't live in the early church times. This early church stuff, that'd have been hard, the persecution. Uh, by the way, persecution is happening today around the world. Um, according to Open Doors USA, which is a nonprofit tracking persecution worldwide, over 300 million Christians live in countries that have high levels of persecution or discrimination. 300 million of our brothers and sisters of Christ face discrimination and persecution every day. Um, last year, and this is documented again by Open Doors USA, uh, 13 Christians were martyred a day. 13 Christians were killed for their beliefs. That's what martyrdom is. Because they were a Christian, they were, they were murdered. 13 a day. 4,500 church buildings were attacked. Uh, 4,200 Christians were imprisoned without trial. Now again, that's documented. Estimates are that these numbers are much higher, but they can't document that. They can't prove that. So these are the low ball numbers. At least that many Christians. So that's around the world. By the way, if you want to read more about that, we've got magazines available uh, from a group called Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, they're going to be at the Connection Centers, and you can pick those up on the way out. I'd love for you to read about that and find out how our brothers and sisters are suffering around the world so you can be praying for them and interceding for them. So that's around the world. In our own nation, the, the First Amendment is under attack, and that First Amendment, you know, guarantees freedom of religion, and it's being threatened. So I have to ask you uh, uh, some questions that, uh, that I hope will haunt you this week. I hope you'll talk about them in life group or with your family. Would you consider it a privilege or a tragedy? Privilege or a tragedy? If Calvary lost its tax-exempt status and was deplatformed on social media because of our biblical teaching. Say, so is that a privilege or is that a tragedy? What does Paul say? Would you consider it a privilege or a tragedy if you lost your job because you attended a Bible teaching church? Would you consider it a privilege or a tragedy if your child couldn't attend a desired college because of your faith? Would you consider it a privilege or a tragedy if I was arrested for teaching the biblical truth about marriage and family? You see, the Apostle Paul considered it a privilege. I'll read it again. For it has been granted 
to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. He's writing that from, in, from being in prison because of his faith. Millions of Christians today face the honor of persecution. So would you be ready if Jesus asked you to suffer in his name? Would you be ready if Jesus allowed you to suffer because of his name? See, it's required if we desire to live worthy of the gospel. I know I'm not worthy of the salvation that I have received. I praise God for it. I know I'm not worthy of the opportunity to preach in the name of Jesus or represent Jesus to this world. But I will tell you this, I want to live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus. What about you? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you because you loved us first and you were willing to send Jesus in this world to suffer on our behalf. And he took shame and abuse, ridicule, humiliation, and torture so that we could be set free. God, forgive us that so often uh, we complain about little things that inconvenience us uh, or, or just make us feel bad instead of actually suffering for the name of Jesus. And God, do whatever it takes in our lives to bring us to a point where we can live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus. That's who we want to be. We cannot be those people apart from you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.